outer limits. Harrison Ford's in action here on BBC One at 10 o'clock tonight and he'll be on the wrong end of Sean Bean's personal vendetta in Tom Clancy's best-selling novel turned into a movie, Patriot Games. That's after tonight's main evening news and campaign report from the BBC with Peter Sissons at 9 o'clock. The former minister Neil Hamilton says he won't chicken out in the face of a challenge from the anti-sleaze candidate Martin Bell. He calls the BBC correspondent a Labour stooge. Mr Bell says he's fighting the poison in the democratic system. Tony Blair drops more of Labour's objections to privatisation. The Chancellor calls Labour unprincipled scoundrels. And Lord Gillean leads from start to finish in the national that defied the bombers. Good evening. The first salvos have been exchanged between the former Minister Neil Hamilton and the independent anti-corruption candidate that Labour and the Liberal Democrats are backing against him. Mr Hamilton, who denies any wrongdoing, accused the TV reporter Martin Bell of condemning him without seeing the evidence. And his wife said, if you think we're going to chicken out, you're all mad. Martin Bell predicted that Mr Hamilton wouldn't survive his constituency adoption meeting on Tuesday night and would be gone by Wednesday morning. Our political editor, Robin Oakley, reports. Seventeen years in the world's trouble spots still hadn't prepared a man who describes himself as about as unpolitical as you can get for the political media circus. I would much rather run the trench lines of Dubinia or tackle Sniper's Alley in my armoured vehicle, Miss Piggy, than be going through this. I really would. So why was he doing it, offering cooperation with the Labour and Liberal Democrat candidates who'll stand down in his favour? I've been aware, because I've followed what's been going on in Mr Hamilton's constituency, of the deep unhappiness of the, of the people there. It's as if there's a kind of a, a poison in the democratic system, which means the democratic system is unable to operate. He told the packed news conference that he hoped his would be the shortest-lived political career ever over by Wednesday if Neil Hamilton steps down or is forced out. Though if he doesn't, and Mr Bell should win, he'd serve through a parliament. The rush job showed in the muted attacks on Mr Hamilton, referring only to what he called a certain amount of stuff out there. I believe that Mr Hamilton is entitled to a presumption of, of innocence. I'm not going to be campaigning against him. I think to some extent he's going to be campaigning against his own record. Anyone offering himself as a white knight can expect close media scrutiny. Mr Bell offered to reveal his bank statements and tax returns, even to pay for the hall when told it had been hired by Labour. In Tatton, Mr Hamilton, appearing with his friend, Coronation Street actor William Roach, left the response to his wife. You know, it's just a complete nonsense for Bell to flip in here with a few hours' notice and say, you know, Hamilton should go, I'm going to stand. He has actually done more to stiffen the resolve of our association I mean, he, he, it's just a serious underestimation of the situation. Um, he thinks that, that he, people are going to think, oh my goodness, Martin Bell, help, we better dump Hamilton. He could not be more wrong. Mr Hamilton's been accused of being paid by business interests to lobby for them in Parliament and of not declaring the alleged payments. Six months ago, he admitted to the BBC he'd taken money from the lobbyist Ian Greer, in return, he says, for introducing business clients. He didn't declare the payments. He says it was unclear at the time whether he needed to. But he's denied taking cash and gifts, in particular from Harrods boss Mohammed Al-Fayed, for asking parliamentary questions. The Prime Minister, who insists Mr Hamilton's candidature is a matter for his local party, had little to say about Martin Bell's intervention. Everyone in this country has a legitimate right if nominated to stand in a general election. If Mr Bell chooses to exercise that right, he has a perfect right to do so, and that is for him to decide. Labour said it was all Mr Major's fault. Mr Bell has crystallised the issue in making it clear if he's, Mr Hamilton stands, then there is an anti-corruption candidate. And the only reason we're doing this is because Mr Major didn't deal with the job himself. Liberal Democrats paid tribute to the war correspondent's qualities. I think Martin Bell is a first-class candidate. I think he will gather the support of people way, way beyond all politics, including many Conservatives.
Mr. Hamilton's future will be determined at a meeting of his local association in this pub tomorrow night. He's determined to fight on. But local Tories who've been seeking to push him out reckon that, perversely, the intervention of such a well-known BBC journalist has made it more likely that local Tories will rally to Mr. Hamilton's support. Robin Oakley, BBC News, Westminster. Tony Blair has given his clearest indication yet that Labour is ready to have a privatisation programme of its own. He told a meeting of businessmen that there should be no dogmatic belief in either the private or public sector. Mr Major said the Labour leader's comments were an admission that he'd abandoned all of his party's traditional beliefs. Our economics editor Peter Jay reports. Tony Blair advanced his tanks onto the Conservatives' front lawn this morning, claiming the economy as a Labour issue. This personal decision by Mr Blair, overruling more cautious advice, came at the beginning of what Labour is calling its business week. Addressing an invited city audience in London, Mr Blair fired off salvo after salvo intended to soften up Tory defences. Prime Minister claims that Britain is booming, as are the words, just as the Conservatives indeed did in the late 1980s. But now, as then, they don't actually have the proposals to ensure that any economic growth is sustained. That's why the title of the lecture that I'm giving today is Prosperity That Lasts. As the Labour leader strove to convince normally sceptical city financiers that new Labour's revolution was real, all and every baggage from old Labour's past was thrown overboard with ruthless abandon. No dash for growth, no inflation, no tax and spend, no national plan, no industrial strategy, no beer and sandwiches with unions, no rewind of the Thatcher reforms, no extension of the state. But Mr Blair's alternative to socialism isn't unbridled market forces or laissez-faire capitalism, it's what he calls the third way. We need therefore to combine flexible labour markets with an attack on the problems in our economy. In other words, we need what we've called flexibility plus. Flexibility plus policies to ensure economic stability, plus partnership with business, plus new leadership in Europe. Kenneth Clark is no mean artilleryman himself and was ready to loose off a few salvos of his own out on the campaign trail around London, okay. um, alleging that all this should have been made clearer in Labour's manifesto last week. They are just unprincipled scoundrels who are prepared to make up any policy as they go along. For 18 years they have fought privatisation in each and every case, and now we're expected to believe the whole Labour movement has changed overnight to see the virtues of privatisation so Gordon Brown can cover up an enormous hole in his public finances. Liberal Democrats concede the economy to no other party. The fact that the Labour Party has changed position um, and has abandoned everything that it believed in in the past uh, and is yet again, I think for the eighth time, changing its position on Europe, is the Labour Party's problem. It's more than 30 years since a Labour leader last made the management of the economy a Labour issue. And though none of Harold Wilson's policies have survived Tony Blair's fumigation of old Labour, Tony Blair's decision to try to recapture this long-lost ground from the Conservatives shows just how determined he is to risk everything to ensure victory. Whether he succeeds, or merely finds that he's put his head in the lion's mouth, will depend on whether the voters give him the trust for which he's asked and on whether John Major can make them feel so good about his boom that they don't want to risk it with Labour. Peter Jay, BBC News, Downing Street. The TUC's General Secretary John Monks insisted he wouldn't expect a Labour government to sell off every lucrative bit of the public sector. And the Communications Workers' Union told the 9 o'clock news it would resist any sale of the Royal Mail's Parcel Force Division. Our economics correspondent Ed Crooks examines what Labour is ruling in and ruling out. I mean, Visiting a city dealing room this morning, Tony Blair may have received a rather warmer reception for the thought that he may soon be in need of some highly paid advisers on privatisation. He says his open-mindedness is nothing new, dating back at least two years to Labour's abandonment of its old Clause 4, its constitutional commitment to public ownership. But his party was certainly fiercely opposed to the sale of the air traffic control system much more recently than that. They want to flog off the National Air Traffic Control Service threatening the new Scottish Control Centre. Let me warn the Transport Secretary Labour will do everything we can to block this sell-off. Our air is not for sale. Now, Labour says, the idea is being considered. 
In fact, the list of what a Labour government would not sell is remarkably short. It wouldn't privatise the post office, the London Underground or Channel 4. It might sell, as well as the air traffic control service, the TOTE, the courier division of the post office parcel force and the Met Office. At most we're looking at a billion pounds a year. Even the Conservatives are only looking at a billion, billion and a half a year through the next few years. That really is virtually neither here nor there in the public finances. And the Post Office Union warned it would continue to oppose the sale of parcel force. It was the government, having examined, spent 1.6 million of taxpayers' money in a review of the Post Office that came to the conclusion that parcel force cannot be ripped away from the rest of the Post Office without it having a detrimental effect, particularly on Royal Mail. But the leaders of the other big unions contacted today were unwilling or unable to comment. One said, it's not us who's standing for election. Another said, we have no reaction at all. But here at the TUC, its General Secretary John Monks did say that he wouldn't expect any future Labour government to sell off every potentially lucrative part of the public sector. Which may be one reason why Labour would prefer to sell assets like Ministry of Defence land. This stretch of Dorset coastline at Kimmeridge, owned by the MOD, is part of the government's assets worth more than £120 billion. Labour says it will root out underused assets to sell. But here again, an expert on the Treasury's finances warns there's no pot of gold waiting to be uncovered. There's been at least two approaches by the Conservatives. Uh, prior options, as it's called, where departments have to identify whether something should be in the public sector or not and the private finance initiative, both of which have driven out those assets which could be sold. So apart from a minor tinkering like that, there isn't huge scope. Tony Blair still thinks selling the railways was a bad idea, but now he's banking on the money it'll raise. The sums that could be raised in the future, however, by any party, no matter how enthusiastic about privatisation, are unlikely to meet the demand for public spending that the next government will face. Ed Crooks. BBC News. The Scottish National Party unveiled its manifesto today, declaring that Scotland could become independent and pay its own way in the world. Its leader, Alex Salmon, said opinion was moving away from Labour's plans for a devolved parliament towards support for full independence. On the Constitution, the SNP says it would create an independent Scotland with a single chamber of 200 MPs elected by proportional representation. Scotland would separately join the European Union. On the economy, the SNP would cut business taxes and increase taxes for people earning more than £26,500. It promises more spending on education, with a nursery place for every three- and four-year-old. And there'd be a Scottish Army, Navy and Air Force, but without nuclear weapons. Opponents say the SNP's programme hasn't been properly costed. This report from our Scotland political editor, Brian Taylor. With the policy package out in the open, the SNP leader Alex Salmond was this evening trying to persuade staff at this Montrose food factory that his party's manifesto offers a tempting low-cost menu. Under the slogan, Yes, We Can, the manifesto claims that Scotland would thrive under independence. And Mr Salmond also challenged the Labour leader, who said that Scottish devolution would leave Westminster's sovereignty intact. Firstly, you can't trust the Tories on tax. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you can't trust Blair on Scotland. And thirdly, you can trust the Scottish National Party to argue for a sovereign parliament for a sovereign people. The SNP claims Scots more than pay their way in the UK, with £27 billion net going from Scotland to the Treasury since 1979. Critics say the SNP's financial analysis is misleading and ignores the damage which breaking the union with England would bring. They make hollow promises but ignore completely the costs of wrenching Scotland out of Britain and the cost of making England a foreign country. The people of Scotland want a decent Scotland, not a separate Scotland. The problem is they always say that everything and everybody would be better off than independent Scotland. And I don't think most people out there, including probably a lot of people who want or may vote SNP, necessarily believe that. Is going to tell them story. The Scottish Secretary today spotlighted Tory plans for nursery education vouchers. The SNP say they'd provide free schooling for three and four year olds. Michael Forsyth claimed the nationalists were telling political fairy stories and living in the past. The uh, Scottish nationalists are, are um, old Labour, uh, moved a few uh, points to the left. Uh, they are the 
uh, last uh, dinosaur, they believe in tax and spend, they believe in unilateral uh, disarmament, they believe in uh, extending the uh, role of the state. All across Scotland, from the Western Isles to the borders, the nationalists are promoting independence. Privately, they'd be content with doubling their present tally of four seats and winning at least a quarter of the Scottish popular vote. Nationalists say the Tories are finished, but won't say how they'd vote in any future Labour devolution referendum. But they reject Labour's argument that devolution would satisfy Scots and in practice would seek to use any future devolved Scottish Parliament as a stepping stone to full independence. Ryan Taylor, BBC News, Edinburgh. That's the news from the campaign trail for the moment. Nine o'clock news, the health of the nation. How the political parties are lining up to convince us that the NHS is safe in their hands. But first, over to Anne Perkins at our Westminster campaign desk for her nightly election roundup. Good evening, Peter. Labour's stamping down hard on any public support for tactical voting. Down in East Sussex, nine members of the party have been expelled for coming out for a Liberal Democrat candidate on the basis that that was the only way to beat the Tories. The party in London points out that supporting another party means automatic expulsion. They're unlikely martyrs, but they've been found guilty of betraying their party and expelled for it. They're Labour supporters urging people to vote Liberal Democrat because that's the best way they can help Labour into power. I'm very sad because we, as far as we're concerned, what we're doing is working as hard as we possibly can here in Lewis to achieve a, 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 a Labour government. If I can have a powerful, strong, confident Labour government with enough majority ready to do some bold changes in this country, then I'll do without party membership. Lewis has traditionally voted Tory, but Labour's handful of votes, around 4,000 at the last election, added to the Lib Dems 20,000 or so, could be enough to swing it. But that, it seems, is to think the unthinkable. So Labour threw out their free-thinking members. Well, on one hand, I'm sad that it's come to this, but on the other hand, I'm very happy that the, uh, the party has acted in this way, because I think it's an absolute disgrace that Labour Party members should be actively asking people to vote for the parties. But that's exactly what this man is doing. He says it's crazy to expel people for working to get rid of the Tories. It's tribal madness. Uh, clearly, after a generation of Conservative government, the name of the game on May the 1st is to get rid of this government. That's the bottom line. There are 90 seats like Lewis where tactical voting could make the difference, but the opposition parties won't even let their members talk about it. Nick Robinson, BBC News. More manifesto launches. The United Kingdom Independence Party, promising 200-plus candidates, wants Britain out of Europe and says it can be achieved within 10 years, saving the country £20 billion a year. The party is offering a home for disenchanted Eurosceptics after the election. We will be the rock uh, of order, if you like, in this great uh, period of flux in British politics, with other parties cracking and groaning and breaking. We expect MPs to come swimming to us to say we believe in the policy of British independence and withdrawal from the European Union. And in Belfast, the Democratic Unionists launched their manifesto. The party leader, Ian Paisley, accused the Conservatives and Labour of betraying Northern Ireland by trying to force it into a united Ireland. He also attacked the rival Ulster Unionists, who he said were guilty of folly and failure in their policies. The Americanization of British politics continues. Political merchandising, big business over there, is getting bigger over here. The guru of political mementos, Kenneth Baker, helped launch long-life collectibles like playing cards. And there are shelf-life perishables too, like edible politicians. Easter's over. The next novelty line from the chocolate factory, political effigies. Who needs opinion polls when you can gauge party leaders' popularity by who gets licked the most? But on the chocometer, it's John Major who's out in front. It's, it's a bit of fun, really. I mean, uh, do you buy uh, John Major or Tony Blair because you like him or because you, you want to uh, bite his head off? You have a choice between four aces here. The ace of spades which is the top card in any pack, as you will know, is John Major. Flogging political merchandise isn't just for elections. 
Nowadays, people make a full-time living out of turning politicians into cuddly toys and politics into impenetrable board games. Though playing cards with political cartoons instead of kings and queens go back to Guy Fawkes. I was used to be the name of Hearts. You see, it's Gordon Brown now. <laughs> so Gordon Brown should watch it. <laughs> Back in the food halls, the news for the Conservatives, Blue Stilton, was not so good. It could be a problem, you know, the fact that we've got the Stilton cheese. Some, someone said to me it's an acquired taste, the Stilton. Labour, Red Leicester, is bestseller, with monster raving loony party. That's cheese and fruitcake coming up fast. Not one of them's got a price on them, and I'm just wondering why none of them have got prices, and is that the catch? Just what everyone wants to know. The Tory chicken has shown he wasn't just a one-day wonder and bird lovers will be relieved to hear that the chicken has been reunited with its head after its testing trip to Scotland last week. But trying to ambush the Labour leader is not a job for the faint-hearted. The hen now has its own minder. That's the one in the blue shirt doing the hugging. Tonight, Conservative Central Office said he's a hero. That's it from us. Back to you in the studio, Peter. Anne Perkins. The introduction of an internal market has been one of the major changes to the NHS brought in by the Conservatives. Labour claims it's resulted in expensive bureaucracy and is committed to abolishing it. But the Conservatives maintain is that it has delivered greater efficiency. The Conservatives say the NHS is treating a million more patients than it did before the reforms and are promising an annual real terms increase in funding. They are committed to attracting more private investment into the NHS to modernise equipment and treatment and want to see GPs providing more services like minor operations at their surgeries. The Labour Party is also committed to year-by-year -year increases in funding and claims that savings made from the abolition of the internal market would treat an extra 100,000 patients. Labour also said it would end waiting lists for cancer surgery. The Liberal Democrats are committed to putting five pence on the price of 20 cigarettes, helping to provide an extra £540 million a year for the NHS. There will be no bed closures for six months so that an independent audit could be carried out. And the party would bring back free eye and dental tests. The Scottish National Party, who launched their manifesto today, say they too would abolish the NHS internal market and provide £35 million in extra funding. The Welsh Nationalist Party, Plaid Cymru, is also committed to ending the internal market and would bring back free eye and dental tests. Our health correspondent, Fergus Walsh, has been to the Royal Hallamshire Hospital in Sheffield to look at the NHS in action. Can you pull the Hallamshire? Coming in, query am I, but we'll be shortly over. OK, we'll send somebody down, thanks. Bye. There, when you need it, what we all hope about the NHS and a principle that all politicians are promising to uphold. Health service staff in Sheffield preparing for the latest incoming emergency know it won't be easy. Every year, the demands on the system increase, there are more emergency admissions and more patients are treated. Staff are constantly under pressure, often unsure if a bed will be free. They feel they're being asked to achieve more with less each year. We could need oxygen because she's and said she's quite short of breath. In fact, health spending has risen by 73% in real terms since 1979. Much has been swallowed up by the needs of an ageing population and the costs of new treatments. All parties would increase spending, but none is offering a blank cheque for a service that already costs £40 billion a year. That figure is little comfort to the young doctor standing over a very sick patient in less than adequate conditions. The £40 billion means nothing on the ground. and We've got to think of it, what the activity on the ground. That's the bit the patient sees, that's the bit the doctor and nurses have to deal with. Yet another arrival at casualty. Bertha is 82, has leukaemia and a painful leg condition. But this time there are no beds. Staff juggle limited resources, putting patients where they can. In the past decade, 800 beds have disappeared in Sheffield alone. And on election day, the casualty unit here is closing down, leaving one A&E unit for the whole city. Do you think you'd be able to sit in a chair just yeah. for a little while? Yes, I can sit in a chair. Are you sure? Yeah. Have you got any pain? 
Nationally, the Liberal Democrats say they'd halt hospital and bed closures for six months. All the parties claim that their approach would squeeze the most from the health budget for direct patient care. This election then is less about what to spend on the NHS and more about how it's spent. Six years ago, the government created a radical new system to try to make cash go further. A business ethos was introduced into the NHS, an internal market created whereby hospitals were forced to compete for patients rather than being funded automatically. The idea was that health authorities and GP fund holders could demand a better service or take their money elsewhere. To stay afloat in the internal market, the Royal Hallamshire, now a self-governing trust, must satisfy the demands of 250 different purchasers. I think it's brought out into the open in a way which has never been seen before, the priority decisions which have to be made. It requires explicit agreements about what can be done per pound spent. And it forces trusts like ours to be much more accountable for what they do. And they're, they're, they're putting an inpatient charter at risk. This is a side of the NHS patients never get to see. Hospital managers discussing whose patients are likely to get treated. Apart from emergency care where the hospital sees all comers, the rest depends on what care individual purchasers are willing to pay for. The hospital says it can't always treat patients solely on the basis of clinical need. The different health authorities are making separate arrangements with us. Managers um, say for some new or expensive treatments, it depends on your postcode whether you get treated. For me, it is not acceptable within the same catchment population that we serve for differential purchasing, i.e. if you live on one side of the street, you can get access to a particular service and you happen to be on the other side of the street in a different purchaser, then you don't get access to it. There has always been inequity in the NHS. The government's changes brought it out into the open although the opposition parties say things are now much worse. Labour says it would abolish the internal market in the NHS, replacing competition with cooperation. There'd be fewer purchasers, but they would still have different priorities. If there is still a continuation of a multiplicity of purchasing, I think differential access, differential purchasing, differential quality standards will still be on the agenda. NHS administrators get a rough ride come election time. All the parties say they'd cut back on grey suits. By abolishing the internal market, Labour says there'd be less form-filling, saving £100 million, about what the NHS spends in a day. The Liberal Democrats say they can save even more, while the Conservatives argue they're already bearing down on bureaucracy. Another policy divide is over how to fund the health service of the future. Sheffield badly needs a new maternity hospital to be built at the back of the Royal Hallamshire. The government wants commercial funding to pay for it under its private finance initiative. As well as building the new hospital, a private firm would replace these outdated facilities with £15 million of new X-ray equipment. Although the trust would still employ doctors and nurses, radiographers like Julie Edwards would be paid by a private company. Right, we're going to ask you to take a big breath in when I'm ready, and then breathe it all out, and then hold your breath out. Labour isn't against private funding, but claims PFI is a step towards privatisation, a fear shared by the health unions. The NHS was never set up to make a profit. It was set up to give free health care to everybody who required it. And now we're to turning the tables totally to make a profit for a company and their shareholders. And the patients seem to be at the bottom of the line uh, when it comes to their care. I think the reality of life is that we won't get the replacement of all our very high-tech, high-cost radiology equipment without going to partnership with a private supplier. Uh, I have to say I'm concerned about the, the, the trade-off for that, which is uh, releasing our radiographers into their employment. Um, that's something I, I'm concerned about, um, but I also accept it's probably the price we have to pay for having uh, a leading-edge, um, high-quality radiology department. Waiting lists are always a focus of political argument during elections, but in recent years the NHS has undergone a quiet revolution in surgical techniques which enables more patients to be treated with fewer beds. Medical advances, such as this machine for removing cataracts, mean 60% of the Royal Hallamshire's planned operations no longer involve an overnight stay. 
Critics say reductions in waiting times, driven through by the patient's charter, have often been at the expense of more urgent cases. After 10 minutes, this man's operation is over. Mr. Hardy, it's the morning after your operation. How's the eye? Well, it feels like it's bionic. It's uh, improved uh, to the point that it's better than my left eye, which I thought was a good eye. The same hospital and from an NHS success story to the health service underperforming. At the admissions ward, there are patients on trolleys in corridors and more waiting in chairs for beds that have yet to come free. Bertha has been waiting for more than four hours to get a bed. I come in hospital at 10 to 1. I've been ever, ever since just at here. What do you feel about it? Oh, I feel awful. All parties accept the NHS needs a period of stability, which means there's less separating them on health than in the past. Each must grapple with the problem of matching limited resources with infinite demand. Fergus Walsh, BBC News, Sheffield. And if you'd like to see more detail on the party's health policies, you can turn to our election fact file on page 130 on CFAX after this news. And the main news again tonight, the former minister Neil Hamilton has said he will stand for election despite a challenge from the anti-corruption candidate Martin Bell. And the Labour leader Tony Blair has given his clearest indication yet that Labour is ready to have a privatisation programme of its own. And tonight in an interview for BBC's Panorama, Mr Blair defended his role in changing the Labour Party so much. From the moment that I came into the Labour Party I've argued that it had to change and modernise and update itself. I was the person who when I was the Treasury spokesman for the Labour Party, was arguing that we had to stand up for the rights of small investors. I was the person, when I got into the shadow cabinet, that withdrew our support for the closed shop. I was the shadow home secretary that was the person that said Labour had to toughen its stance on law and order, that we had to stand up for the rights of the citizen against the criminal. I was the person that argued the case. Robin Oakley, to say the least, it's been an interesting day. First, this business up in Tatton, more like a political novel. Well, it's certainly... Um, bizarre circumstance really to have an independent uh, candidate standing not just standing on a single issue but having other parties stepping down to make way for him we've never really had a situation like that but it is going to complicate the issue enormously if Neil Hamilton does continue as the conservative candidate with Martin Bell against him because if the only issue at stake is going to be an anti-corruption candidate what happens to all the other issues that people like to make up their mind on and and vote in an election I asked Martin Bell about that at his press conference this afternoon and he said well he'd have to mug up a bit and and offer an attitude at least on some of the major questions of the day. But what else would happen, for example, if uh, we had the election, Martin Bell was elected, and then Neil Hamilton was cleared by Sir Gordon Downey's report? Would we then have to have a by-election? Would Martin Bell then stand down? Did he answer that one? Uh, he appeared to indicate that, that uh, he probably wouldn't stand down because uh, the, there were wider questions involved in his candidature. Mm. The other big development today, the jettisoning, jettisoning by Labour of the last of its ideological baggage on privatisation, if you take it at its face value. Does that give the Tories some difficulties now? Well, it, there are some difficulties for the Tories in that Labour is, is working very hard on reassuring the public on its uh, image of reformism, not revolution. It's come round to share so much common ground with the Conservatives. But that also, uh, I mean, you know, we've seen it on, on defence, we've seen it on trade unions, we've seen it on tax and so on. Uh, but that enables the Tories to say, well, here's Labour changing its mind on so many different issues. How can you guarantee that this party will not change its mind constantly when it's in government? How can you guarantee that this party will carry forward the sort of programme it has? And if it's now saying that so many things the Tories have done are right, including privatisation, how can it say that Tory government has been such a failure over 18 years? So there are difficulties for, for Labour too. Has the Labour Party stolen a march on the Tories with these remarks by Robin Cook, who now says it's improbable that there'll be a single currency in the next Parliament? A lot of Tories, of course, would love 
their Prime Minister to be able to say that, but cannot because of his Cabinet colleagues who would not tolerate that. But what sort of position does that put the Conservatives in now? I think it, it does cause them difficulties, and it was significant that Tony Blair in his Panorama interview tonight was echoing Robin Cook's line that, that it is unlikely for, that a Labour government would take Britain into a single currency at the start of the next Parliament, and therefore unlikely we, we'd be going in in the lifetime of a Parliament. The problem for the Tories there is that they've got a whole lot of their candidates who want to issue individual election addresses saying they're entirely against a single currency. And if Labour is now presenting itself as a rather more Eurosceptic party than Labour, which it's able to do while sharing a policy with the Conservatives, but talking about the timing, a lot of Tories will say to Mr Major, come on, we've got to have a tougher anti-Europe line and all the Tory troubles will redouble. Robin Oakley, thank you very much. And that's the news tonight. News night is on BBC Two at 10.30 from the 9 o'clock news. Good night. Thank mm -hmm. you.